In the ancient times, people invented something called math, which even today can be used to make your friends hate you so you can spend more time alone in your room playing Fortnite. And today, to honor that ancient art, I want to show you five math problems that you can really use to rile up your comrades. A couple of these will be a lot more effective if you and your friends are in middle school or high school, but the rest of them, depending on how much math your friends know, can really rustle their jimmies. The video has chapters so you can skip around the problems as you please. The idea with all of them is that they're problems people often get wrong and so your friends are likely to get them wrong and then you can bully them for it. Obvious disclaimer, use these problems for fun, to have a laugh, to maybe spark up some mathematical arguments. But if you have a friend in school who's struggling with math and the self-doubt that can come with that, Maybe don't use these problems to make fun of them. Math is a powerful club. Wield it responsibly. Problem one, a 10 foot rope ladder hangs over the side of a boat with the bottom rung on the surface of the water. The rungs are one foot apart. The tide goes up at the rate of six inches per hour. How many rungs are above the water after four hours? So here's the situation, right? We've got this ship and a rope ladder that's coming down from it. You can see this rung here. It's just on the surface of the water. This little picture doesn't exactly represent the problem, but it just gives us an idea what we're imagining. You can, of course, try to solve this problem yourself. What a lot of people are going to do when given this problem, especially if you tell it to them, you know, kind of fast and really egg them on to solve it, what they're going to do is a little bit of basic math. They'll say, okay, here's the surface of the water. On the surface, we have this bottom rung of the rope ladder, and we know from the problem that the rungs on the ladder are one foot apart. So if we go up one foot, we get another rung. Go up two feet, we get another rung rung, three feet, another rung, and so on. In total, we're able to go up 10 feet because that's how long the rope ladder is. That of course means that from the surface to the end of the rope ladder, we have 11 rungs. All the rungs are one foot apart and we know that the tide, which is right here right now, the tide is going up at the rate of six inches per hour. So most people will say after one hour, it's gone up six inches, that's halfway to the next rung. After two hours, it goes up another six, six inches for a full foot, and so now that rung is on the surface. After the third hour, it goes up another six inches, so another halfway towards the next rung. And then after another hour, it goes up another six inches, and so this rung is now resting on the surface. And so their answer would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rungs, or eight rungs, depending on whether or not they count this one on the bottom. Of course, the issue is that's not the right answer, because all 11 rungs would be above the water, no matter how much the tide rises. That's because the rope ladder is attached to the boat, and as the tide rises, so too does the boat and thus, so too does the ladder. So if you're trying to make fun of your friends with this one, don't be overly concerned about whether or not they're including the bottom rung that rests on the surface. Just know that if they're doing any math at all, they're doing it wrong because no math is required. And just this once, I'll give you an example of some possible post-problem banter to help you brainstorm. What'd you say? Nine? <laughs> Bro said nine! <laughs> <laughs> Bro, be so for real right now. Have, have you ever even seen a ship? <laughs> Bro must have studied math from how to learn math by smelling math books. <laughs> Nine wrongs. <laughs> This next one's probably gonna hit the hardest somewhere in the seventh to ninth grade range. Tell your friend to solve this. X squared equals 25, so what's X? The easiest way this could then go is that your friend says, oh, well, that's easy. Obviously, X has to be five because five squared is equal to 25. But if they say that, then you can make fun of them for not knowing what a negative number is because the correct solution is X equals five or negative five. Of course, it's true that five times five is equal to 25. So it is a solution, but it's not the complete solution because it's also the case that negative five times negative five, remember the negatives cancel out. So yes, this too is 25. Now, if you're not able to catch them here, you can use this as a bit of a setup for one more attempt. Your friend might say, no problem, X is five or negative five. Then you say, okay, now solve X equals the square root 
of 25. Of course, this is where by asking them the first question, you've now tried to bait them into saying that the correct answer is X equals five or negative five, because either of these numbers squared produces 25. But of course, this is not correct. And it's often confusing to people that even though five and negative five would both be valid solutions to this, and in fact, you would need both of them for a complete solution, the square root of 25 is just plain old positive five. That is the definitively correct answer to this question. The reason for this is that the square root symbol is just a symbol mathematicians came up with, and of course, we want it to be useful. And for us, it's most useful if this acts as a function. For it to be a function, one input needs to yield one output. The square root of x is just not a very useful thing to write if this could be two different numbers. For example, if x is four, maybe we'd say, well, this should be two or negative two. That's not super useful though. It's more useful if we just restrict it to be the non-negative answer. That way, if we actually want the negative one, we can just pop a negative symbol in front Front, but otherwise it represents one definite number, provided of course that x itself isn't negative. Think for example, what would a calculator tell us if we put in the square root of 25 and negatives were allowed? The calculator wouldn't know what to say. Do I report five or negative five? It totally destroys the symbol, so we don't let that happen. I'll just show you real quick, for example. Oh, whoops, this is my ultra rare sealed TI-1106. Can't use that. Here we go, whoops, that's my ultra rare sealed bilingual TI. 108. Here we go, using the classic TI-108, we can put in 25, and then press the square root button, bam, you get 5. No negative sign, no either or, it's 5. Alright, here's a classic, this one can irritate all sorts of folks. Connect all 9 dots using 4 straight lines without lifting your pencil. If you set somebody this challenge, either you or they will of course have to get 9 dots to work with, and most people will have no issue jumping right into some attempts. There's one straight line, let's see, two straight lines, there's three straight lines, there's four straight lines and oh, we've missed one. Okay, but we were pretty close. Maybe try again, just something slightly different. Maybe if we knock out the diagonal first, one straight line, two straight lines, three straight lines, Oh, four straight lines. Again, there's one missing. People could go on and on like this, and you can continue assuring them that no, it's it's possible. It is possible to connect all nine dots using four straight lines without lifting your pencil. The issue with the solutions that people will usually attempt is that all of their lines remain within the confines of the grid, which is not a condition specified in the problem. You just have to use four straight lines and not lift your pencil. It's not the case that you can't leave the grid. Grid. So here's how you solve the problem. Take your first line down low enough so that you can then go and hit those two dots and up high enough so that you can then cross those two to go back to your starting point and then one more stroke to knock out the remaining two dots. So that was down, up, over and back down. Now, if you want them to feel less cheated, I wouldn't give them nine dots on a square like this because that's going to communicate that you have to stay on the square. I also wouldn't give them the nine dots already inside of a square. Don't include that as part of the diagram. You want that condition that they have to stay inside the square to just be a figment of their imagination. So don't let your presentation of the problem suggest it. It's just in their mind. Of course, giving them the nine dots on a big paper like this makes it more likely that they'll actually arrive at the correct solution, but hey, that's the fun. All right, on to problem four. Oops, sorry, wrong problem. Uh, yes, this one with the fences. Three men paint three fences in three hours. How long does it take one man to paint one fence? And here are beautiful pictures of three men painting three fences. Now, this is like one of those priming language tricks where you have someone, you know, spell for, say fork and so on until you trick them into making some mistake. You get their brain thinking along a certain pattern and then they make an error. In this case, the mistake people often make is to say, well, if three men paint three fences in three hours, obviously one man would paint one fence in one hour. It's just begging for that answer, but that is a nonsensical answer. You really just have to picture it, right? Here are our three men. They're painting their fences. It takes them three hours and then all three fences are painted. So how long does it take one man to paint one fence? Well, it took three hours for these three fences to get painted. 
and there's three men painting the three fences. One man, one fence takes three hours. Of course it takes three hours for one man to paint a fence because three men gets you three fences in three hours. So this is a really nice one. You don't even have to write out the math. People will get this wrong very often and it's easy to correct their reasoning. All right, time for the last problem. I found this video on X recently and I'm going to show it to you to present this problem. So you can see there's this pattern which people are trying to walk along and just from the clip, you can infer the conditions of the problem. The challenge is to cross each edge or arc of the pattern exactly once, so you can't retrace your footsteps. Notice that it's okay if you arrive at the same point twice, you just can't cross the same arc or line twice. This is actually a problem from a relatively new field of mathematics called graph theory. And this particular problem takes place on what's called a complete graph on four vertices. You see, a graph consists of vertices and edges that that join pairs of vertices. To make our graph complete, we have to connect every pair of vertices, like so. These get connected, these get connected, these get connected, these get connected, and these get connected. The shape of the edges that connect the vertices is actually not important. It's only the structure of the arrangement that is important, not the exact appearance. Of course, drawn this way, the complete graph on four vertices looks nice and matches the pattern in the video, but it doesn't have to look like this. It could, for example, also look look like this, or it could look like this. Either way, it's the same graph, and if you have a particularly non-perceptive friend, you might be able to offer them all three of these as separate problems. The tape on the floor style in the video, of course, is fun because you can walk along it, but it's just as easy to use pencil and paper. And the fun in trying to walk every single edge in these K4 graphs exactly once can continue until your friend stops believing you that it's possible. Of course, the part that makes it frustrating is it is completely impossible to accomplish this task. And to understand why, it's helpful to think about two cases. If we were actually able to solve the problem and cross every edge exactly once, one possibility is that we start and end at the same vertex. Doing this is what's called an Euler tour. And if we start and end at the same vertex, it's easy to see that every vertex must be touching an even number of edges. Because if I'm walking along this graph, anytime I arrive at a vertex, I must leave it. So anytime I arrive and leave, that counts for two edges touching the vertex. And since every time we arrive at a vertex, we have to leave it, there has to be an even number of edges touching the vertex for that to be possible. The only exception is the vertex we start and end at. Maybe it's this one. It's a little bit different, but it's the same sort of situation. We leave it and eventually we will have to arrive because we're starting and ending at the same place. So when we leave that starting vertex, well, at the end of the day, we're going to come back. So again, that accounts for two edges. So the number of edges a vertex touches has to be even, otherwise we would eventually get stuck while trying to complete one of these Euler tours. And you can see that happening. If we try to do an Euler tour on this graph, I might then go over here and then I go over here, but now I'm stuck. There's no edge available to me to leave this vertex. And thus there's no way to get over here to cross that last edge. Of course, if we're just trying to cross every edge exactly once, it's not necessary that we start and end at the same vertex. So it is also possible that we could start and end at different vertices. Then this is no longer called an Euler tour, but rather an Euler trail. If we're starting and ending at different vertices, then everything we just said is still true about needing an even number of edges, except for the vertex we start at and the vertex we end at. And this means that if we start and end at different vertices, then there are two vertices, the starting and ending one, that can have an odd number of edges, but every other vertex still has to have an even number of edges. In these graphs, every vertex has an odd number of edges, so neither of these things are possible. From what I just said, if we had two vertices with an odd number of edges, then it would be possible, so let me quickly demonstrate that. We'll let these two vertices have an odd number of edges. They both have three edges right now. So to fix these other two that also have an odd number of edges, we're going to add an additional vertex and then join that vertex to those two vertices with an odd number of edges. And so now they have an even number of edges. And of course, our new vertex also has an even number of edges. So if we had a totally different graph, then this would be possible. We could start at this vertex, then go this way, 
then this way, then this way, then this way, then this way, then down this way, then around that way, and then past this last edge. This one, I suppose, is the least honest of the problems because to irritate your friend, you just have to tell them it's possible when you know it's not. However, mathematically, it's definitely the most interesting. Anyways, have fun with these problems. Let me know if your friends get a kick out of them and if you've encountered any of these problems in the past. And if you enjoy my videos, consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get exclusive and early access to all sorts of fun videos and a bunch of original music too. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep a cable cut and untucked the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull my brain and push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you're so, so.